missing this morning? That's a lot. And I'm sure it wasn't all due to illness, probably the majority it was. So we're glad you're healthy. And, um, and as we've said before, if you are sick, it's appropriate to stay home, right? That's a loving thing to do, not to share it, right? So, uh, but we're glad you're here. We'll just keep praying God for good health and, uh, uh, and if pray for those that are sick. Um, we've been talking on and off Sunday night about great worship, and I promise that one time we get to the preacher and his part and the sermon, and I know you would love to have input, so um, if you want to, write on a piece of paper and I'll take your notes. <laughs> We're not going to address any complaints, all right? Uh, but great worship. Worship is about showing what God we think, he, how great we think he's worth. Remember that? And I don't know if we ever can worship in, in the perfect way because we're just mortal beings and it, we fail to comprehend how great God is. And until we get to heaven, we'll probably never really grasp who, what a great God he is in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we still always want to do our best. And that's why great worship starts from the heart. And you could have... Uh, and a small crowd, you could have average singing, you could have prayers where the person stutters but doing the best he can, and you could have a ho-hum speaker, but you could have great worship in your heart. You with me? Would you agree? Because it does not depend upon what's going around externally. It all depends on what starts internally. Now, do those other things help? Well, of course. And do we collectively want to do our best? Absolutely. But it starts here, and that's where I, I want us to see. And so uh, when we're worshiping, we're bringing something to God. We're not trying to get something from him. But by offering him our gifts of praise and prayer and song, we do get something back. So it's a balanced relationship. I understand that. There is give and take. But... It's all about letting God know what we think he's worth. And so when we talk about worship, we have to talk about the sermon because often the sermon can tend to dominate the hour of worship. And you might ask, is that appropriate or not? Well, let's just say this. It is an integral part. And you look back in history that they spent a lot of time in the oratory presentation of God's word. There were several reasons for this. One of it is that that the average person did not have the scripture, <clears throat> and if they did, they couldn't read it. And I accounted, reaccounted to you um, how in Africa, as well as other places, <clears throat> a lot of people don't have Bibles, and a lot of them are illiterate. And so when Paul tells Timothy to give public attention to the reading of scripture, you, that has a lot of personal application. The only time some of the time that they'll ever hear God's word is when it's read in a public assembly. And so they would read a lot of it uh, in, in uh, the worship services there. It's sometimes the only time they would hear God's word. They'd memorize it by song, and they'd memorize it in their, their classes. And so memorization was all part of it. But a sermon and the preaching of the word was very important as it is to this day. But it involves everyone engaged in this activity. Now, often we think, that preaching is a passive activity for the audience. In other words, you sit and you can just relax, kind of digest your food and just review in your mind that uh, uh, how the um, New England Patriots won again <laughs> in the fourth quarter, even though they're down by 10. You can be mad at uh, Tom Brady if you want. Or you can be active in what's being said and we're going to give you some tips how to do that, all right? Because it is an active part. You are honoring God by listening to his word and as it is presented. So let's talk about the preacher itself, you know, why preaching? And when we look at it, Paul exhort, exhorts Timothy that, that you've learned from your childhood the scripture, which he says gives you wisdom that leads to salvation, then he goes on to say, as we have memorized, many of us, all scriptures inspired of God, it's profitable. What's it profitable? And he lists this for teaching, for reproof, 
for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished for every good work. So effective teaching and preaching equips people so they can go out there and minister for the Lord. And we'll give some examples of that later. We also see in uh, uh, Romans chapter 10 that whoever believes on the Lord and confesses with their mouth that he is Lord will be saved. And then he asks the question, well, how can they call on him whom they've not heard? And of course, if, how can they call on him if they haven't believed on him? And how can they believe if they have not heard? And that's why I say, how can they hear without a preacher? Now, that's a good question. Now, this might be talking about evangelism specifically, but does not apply to those that are already saved. How can they grow if they don't hear the word? So faith cometh by hearing, and the only way you could grow in your faith and learn the will of God so you can be trained in righteousness is by the hearing of the word. Now, it's not just reading the word. How many times have you had the, read, the word, you've read it, but then you sat at, at a good teacher at his feet and you go, wow, I never saw that in there, but yeah, it's right there. And they kind of just open it up to you and you go, wow, that's called exegesis, that they expound on what's there and they put the pieces together and everyone's had good teachers in their life, and I have too, and they just, that's how you learn, and you uh, guide people. So that's why we have preachers. So let's talk about the preacher itself. It's interesting, the word preacher is only used three times in the Bible, twice by Paul, and once about Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness. It comes from a word which means to herald, and someone who is charged with responsibility to keeping the message accurate that he was given to present to others. Why is it only used three times? Some have suggested it's because the emphasis should be on the message and not the title of the preacher. The other word that is used is evangelist. Timothy is called evangelist. Paul told him, fulfill your work or uh, the, your work of an evangelist. Um, Titus was an evangelist. Uh, Philip is called the evangelist. An evangelist is someone that is spreading the good news. It has in its root word the gospel. Is a, someone that is spreading the glad tidings. But let's look at the qualifications of a preacher real quick so you can understand then his part in this work, all right? Now, first of all, he's got to be both faithful and able. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul tells Timothy, entrust the things you have received in, to faithful men so they might be able to teach others, be able. So he says, find faithful men... They're going to be faithful to the word. They're going to present it correctly, not add to it or subtract it, that they'll be able to preach to teach others. That implies some ability, does it not? You've got to be able. Now, that's a subjective thing, ability. In other words, you've got to be able to speak the English language or whatever language you're teaching in. You have to have just some concepts of basic oratory skills. And let's just... Be frank, can we? Some people ought not be preaching publicly. Is that correct? Now, can everyone preach privately one-on-one? -on -one? So in one sense, we're all preachers, aren't we? We're all called to uh, spread the gospel to uh, those that around us. But we're talking about, in this context, a, in a public type of way. So they got to be faithful and able. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 12, as you're turning there, I love hearing those Bibles and those phones click. <laughs> I mean, do they click? I don't know. What do you call a person that preaches one thing but lives another way? The hypocrite. So verse 12, Paul teaching, talking to the young evangelist Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness. Don't you give them reason to despise you. But rather in your speech, your conduct, your lay, love, your faith and purity, show yourself as an example of those who believe. So before you open your mouth and say, here's how you ought to live. Here's how your conduct should be, your speech should be. You show it first. You make sure your life matches up with your message. And that's why he tells them in chapter 4, pay attention to yourself and to your teaching. And this way, you'll ensure salvation for both those that hear you and yourself. 
The saddest thing is to preach the truth of the gospel, but not apply it and lose your own soul. And that happens. It does. So be an example, because that message speaks louder than words. And then 2 Timothy 2, the old King James says, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. The New Marian Standard just says, Be diligent, energetic, passionate. And what does that mean? You can't preach well what you don't know well. And when you take the word and you're dividing it, open it up to so people can see it, it takes a lot of effort and study and preparation or else you can't do it. And you're going to be held to a standard that others won't. That's why James 2 says, not let many of you be teachers because you will incur a stricter judgment if you don't teach it correctly. Now, those are just some overviews of the qualification of a preacher. But what about his work? Well, um, here is just chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, and it's a passage I will use with young preachers a lot, and it lists out a lot of things that a preacher is supposed to do. He says, pointing out these things, you'll be a good minister of the sound words of the gospel. And you've got to look at what those things were. But just pointing things out that are going to happen, that are coming. Uh, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. He says, prescribe and teach. He says, be an example. We already read that one. Give attention to public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Exhorting is to encourage and build up. We would say, man, that was a powerful, motivating lesson. That's what he's saying there. Exhortation. And how do you exhort people? With nice self-help ideas. Exhortation and teaching. What will exhort people is the word when it's presented correctly. And, and properly. So he says to uh, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them. And again, if you don't know them and if you're not diligent about this study and this prep, you can't be an effective teacher. So he says pay close attention yourself and your teaching. Persevere in these things. This is the idea of just it's your passion. It's long suffering. There's many hours put in it. So let me just say this is tough because I'm speaking about myself and I don't want it to sound self-serving, all right? So I'm going to pretend you're a bunch of fellow preachers because we'll have this conversation with each other, all right? Um, fellow preachers, have you ever had anyone ask you, what do you do during the week? <laughs> what do you do for a real job? I mean, you preach on Sundays, but what do you do during the week? How many times have you been asked that? And all the hands will go up, yeah. Yeah, as a fellow preacher, right? And I get asked that, not so much here anymore. But in its honest question, sometimes people want to know. They go, what do you do? Do you think if you're paying attention to this and persevering these things, you would have time in the week for anything but your preaching? Now, I'll explain uh, something about that in a second, but it takes, I remember... Uh, Lowell, who is, I studied under in preacher training, he says, right now as a single person working full-time, Jack, you'll have more time to prep and study than you ever will in your life. And I go, yeah, right, because I have to work 40 hours a week plus longer. I have to spend time with my friends. I got to take all your classes. I got to do all your homework, and I don't have time to prep. And when I preach full-time, I'll just be able to sit back in my chair and uh, have my wife feed me all the meals, and I'll just have all the time in the world to prep and prepare. Guess what? He was exactly right. I covet the time I could be alone to do my prep because those hours slip away so quickly between classes and calls and things that have to come up and deal with. You, you, I would like you to follow me around. Right, fellow preachers? You can say, amen, I have the same problem. Now, a lot of people say, well, do you golf on Mondays? It used to be preachers always golf on Mondays because Mondays are typically a day off. I haven't golfed, period, much less on a Monday for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Because Monday, I covered that time with my family or wife or whoever, and I don't have time to take four hours golfing. Now, I'm not whining. I, does it sound like I'm whining? Good. <laughs> I'm just trying to get you to see the picture if you're doing the work and passionate, and again, it sounds self-serving, doesn't it? But there's not time. 
there's not a lot of time. And most people that you want to have classes with, when are they available? During the day or during the evening? They're in the evening. So now your evenings got uh, taken up. And a big fault of mine, and Ann will attest to it, is when we were younger with kids home, I spent too many hours out at night and not at home with the family. But that's when you could talk with people and have Bible studies. And so, no, time is a premium. And it's hard to find time just to prep for your... He said, teach and print the, preach these principles. Second Timothy, here are the verbs. Instruct, be strong, and trust, suffer, remember, remind, diligent, be diligent, preach, reprove, rebuke, exhort, be sober, endure, do, fulfill your ministry. Now, all you get impressed with that, I hope, is that preacher is a life full of action, activity. Even though he may be sitting, he is working a lot. So that's what I do during the week. So look at the qualifications. He's an example. He's a diligent student. I would share with you, and then we're going to talk about the audience. Ephesians chapter 4, I won't read that one, but I'll quote it to you, where he says in verse 11 and 12, God has given many gifts to the church, some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, then as elders or pastors and teachers. Well, why did he give these offices or these roles to the church? He says in verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So you can go out and minister. You know, be better servants for the Lord out in the world, letting your light shine. Better fathers, better parents, better lovers of your neighbors, helping the widows, the orphans, whatever it is. Equipping you so you can go out and serve. But here's the end game. Here's the goal. And I do want you to read that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And you need to really memorize this and own it for yourself. Because Paul is dealing with these people that want to teach, and they don't know what they're talking about. That is in verse uh, 6 and 7. Some teaching are just for the, uh, the power or making merchandise of others. That's Peter's message. But he says, here he is, verse 5, the goal of our instruction. If you could put one word on the total purpose of any sermon, any teaching in a class, here it is. The goal of our instruction, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, is love. That's all it is. Not any kind of love. Love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Jesus said a student or a disciple, when he's fully trained, will be just like his master. So when we're done being equipped by the word, who will we look like in action and word and every other aspect? Jesus Christ. And Jesus, what was the one command that he gave us that was overarching over all of them? A new command, a great command. Love one another as I have loved you. So all our teaching should have one end result, that you become more loving like God is himself. So that's why we teach don't do these things because they're unloving, they're harmful. That's why we teach do these things because they are loving. Now, we're not just teaching compliance. We're at the same time, we're trying to transform the heart so people will take this and run with it willingly. Now, that's hard. It's one thing to be an employer and tell an employee, do this or you're fired. Okay, they'll do it, right? It's another thing to try to create a willingness of spirit. So they do it spontaneously and naturally because that's now who they are and not for the paycheck. How challenging is that? To get your children to say, yes, I gladly, dad or mom, do what you say. No whining, no moping, okay, if I have to. Isn't that our goal with our children? It, that's a huge challenge, but that's what we're doing here. And... Uh, so here I got this chart for you. Of course, there's the scripture. It's love from a pure heart. You're doing it from the heart with no false motives. A good conscience. In other words, you do it when you, you love when you know you should. And you never walk away from opportunities. And it's in a sincere faith. So here it is, the goal of our teaching. It's in the middle, love. And so when you look at the Bible, it's full of things that are interesting. And I would call them they're of curious nature 
but they're esoteric. In other words, they don't matter. People used to argue how many angels would fit on the pin of a head, a head of a pin, right? I don't know, and I don't care, okay? But people have asked that and, and talked about it. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting things, though. Granted, it's fun having the discussions, but do they really matter and produce love in your life? And the answer is no. Then there's unimportant issues. Um, can't even think of unimportant issues because I try to forget them. I don't remember them. Uh, can you think of an unimportant issue? What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? You, I guess it's not important because the Lord didn't tell us. The importantest fact is he had one. What it was doesn't matter, all right? Uh, how long it took him to take a journey if it doesn't tell us. But then there are helpful issues, like um, when we see the eunuch being baptized and that whole scenario. Is that all helpful? The help, does it help us understand the nature of baptism and how it happens? Look, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? We learn so much about baptism by his questions and Peter's answer, or uh, Philip's answer, you can if you believe. And so I do believe. So they both went, what? Down. down into the water. Why did they go down in the water if they could just sprinkle some on them? You know, it's all very helpful, but it's still not the purpose. Then there are important issues. Like Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized should be saved. That's important. But that's not the goal. The goal is what? Love. Why do I teach he that believes and is baptized shall be saved? Because that's the loving thing to teach. You want to see people what? Get saved. Isn't that loving? So we teach that because it's central, it's important, but it helps show love to them. That's our goal. Now, a lot of teaching is on these outer circles, this head knowledge. It's academic. Or it deals with issues. Well, you can go to college for that. We're like a spiritual votech. Does that make sense? A votech school is where you learn how to weld or how to become an electrician or a hygienist. It's hands-on. It's practical. And then when you're done after 18 months or two years, you can go out immediately in the field. We're not interested in giving you head knowledge. We're trying to equip you so you can go out and get a job spiritually because you are in God's army right, in his service. And that's a challenge because a lot of people just love to study the Bible for the sake of studying. They don't want to do anything about it because they think just learning it fulfills their Christian obligation. No, the goal of our message is love. And if your congregation you're with that is not producing and teaching love and equipping people to love, go to another congregation. Did I say that? No. <laughs> Go to the eldership and talk to them and said, what are you going to do with that preacher? Because he's just filling us with head knowledge. We need to know how to love. Does that make sense? That's the goal. All right. So when we look at all that, there's the goal. This is what happens often. It, it gets off center. And your discussions often will get off center. You'll ask questions that are about unimportant issues that really don't matter. Have you ever done that? I've done it. I've debated people about things that don't matter, all right? Uh, that's not what we want to do because that's off-focus preaching. And then with that being said, here's balance. Teach what the Bible teaches. That's the only thing we teach. But emphasize what the Bible emphasizes. Is that simple? I mean, teach it all, the whole counsel of God. Don't leave anything out. But when you're teaching something, emphasize what's centrally important. And the rest is just context, just context. Now, that's a huge job to do. So does the audience have a part in this? So forgive me, because now I have to speak to you. And it would be easier if someone else came here and did this because, it's, again, it sounds self-serving. But you'll give me a lot of grace and permission to speak frankly, right? Not that you all have a problem with it, but I just have to say it the way it is. And if I step on someone's toes, I'm sorry. I'm just speaking in a general term, all right? First of all, 
audiences are both fascinating and variegated. When I mean variegated, no two uh, members in the audience are the same. They're all different. We have babes in Christ that are just coming to the Lord, and they, if you said, let's go to Acts chapter 2, they don't know where Acts is. But that's wonderful. We're glad we're here because they're like little babies. They're like sponges. They're soaking up everything. Then we have, on the other hand, people that have heard the book of Acts studied and presented five, six times. Anyone been through a study five times in the book of Acts? I'm sure some of you. And so you know it. You could probably teach it as well as the teacher, honestly. And so we have this wide range of knowledge. Then we have people that are just suffering a divorce. Someone who just come out of a, a job layoff, and some other people are going on vacation tomorrow. So where's their mind? It's certainly not here. It's hard to keep it here. It's, it's over there in the sun somewhere on a sandy beach. And so you have this audience made up of young and old, immature spiritually, immature spiritually, uh, all sorts of issues, and we're trying to get them to focus on what God is saying and be engaged in this part of the worship. It's hard, really hard. But when you have an eager, eager listener, that's a preacher's dream. When someone you can tell by their posture and just their eye contact, they're into it. Not to you, but what is being said. On the other hand, you can see the opposite. When someone is disinterested, they're here by the insistence of someone else, whether it's a spouse or a parent or whatever, or they don't want to be here. You can see it the way they shift from side to side. And their eyes are never looking. And they're on their cell phones. Or they're talking to someone else. Or they're doing something else. Or they're sleeping. Now let me just say this. Has everyone battled sleeping? In this? I'm not talking about those times where you battled it because you've been up all night. The baby was up. You're sick. You work late. You got here just after work. I've fallen asleep in services too. But I'm talking about those people that do it as a... A habit. And fortunately, we just don't have many here. And those do sometimes are seniors, and we understand we give you that. So I'm not trying to, you know, poke anyone. But I'm just giving you, you see all that. The preacher sees it all, uh, what people are doing. So we have obligation to be ready to listen. It's sleep, dress, Bible, and notes. If you know tomorrow's the day of worship, does it behoove us to be prepared before we get there? Go to bed a little earlier the night before. I had to apologize to Kevin, who's back with the baby, because um, he texted me about what songs he could pick out to follow a theme for the sermon. And uh, I already turned my phone off because I went to bed at 7.30. <laughs> my wife said, you're going to bed at 7.30. I said, yeah, I got a big day tomorrow. But uh, does that make sense? If you know you got a big day tomorrow, don't stay up till 1 or 2 in the morning. Um, is dress appropriate? You say, for the sermon? No, just for the worship. Yes. And we didn't talk about dress codes. We talked about heart codes earlier. But bring your Bible. Bring a notepad. Bring a pencil because you're going to be active. I have found that anyone that is speaking, I can get something out of it. And it keeps my attention if I write notes. I try to outline their lesson whether they have an outline or not. I try to do it and it forces me to listen and it's a practice I've developed, and so now it just comes natural. And then when they uh, put a quote or a scripture, and I just go, well, that's good. And, and I might take off in my mind some thoughts about it and then come back to his lesson later. Have we all done that? But at least I'm learning, right? And see, listening is an active, uh, 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 not a passive activity. You have to be engaged in it. Take notes. And please, 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 open your Bible. We open your Bible. So I already know that verse. Every time you turn to your Bible and see it on that page again, you see it again, you read it again, it comes imprinted in your mind and on your heart, and this becomes a tool that you can just flip through and you can use so quickly and easily. And every time you look at it and read it, man, I never saw that verse before. I never saw that verse after it. Every time you look, you'll see something again. But if you just listen and don't look, you're, 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 uh, you're cheating yourself, is what I'm trying to say. All right? You say, well, can I use my Bible app on my phone? Absolutely. But just open it up and follow along.
Does that make sense? All right. So uh, listening, come with prayer. Say, Lord, help me. Fill my mind with the knowledge of your will that I might walk worthy in all aspects, bearing fruit in every good work. That's Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. That's Paul's prayer. Fill my mind with the knowledge of your will. And then your place you sit makes a difference. Okay, I know some people like sitting in the back. You know what a preacher's dream would be? It's everyone sat. We have, you know what? 40% full if everyone sat in the front rows up. You say, well, I can listen just as well in the back. Yeah, I know you can. That's fine. But if you're having a trouble listening in the back, try moving forward. Because who would agree there's a different experience up here than there is back there? Who would agree? You're more engaged. You're more involved. So if you're having a problem and you're struggling, and if you're really tired and you don't want to fall asleep, sit right here so I can watch you. I promise you won't fall asleep or else you'll find it very difficult. There was a little boy and, and he said, uh, Johnny, wake up your dad. You know, uh, and the little boy said, well, preacher, you wake him up. You're the one that put him to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and that gets to our next point coming up. But your posture. I, 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 one person I remember in a, a congregation when I was preaching, they're always down with their head down. I don't know if they were sleeping disgusted with me, meditating on what I was saying, or reading their Bible. I had no clue, but very seldom they ever looked up. I had no idea if they were engaged or not. So your mind starts thinking other things. Now, when a person's looking at me right there, it powers, empowers the preacher. Like, I've got these guys, and it's, it's encouraging. When people are going like this, it creates anxiety, and lack of confidence, and it, it's just, it's not helpful. And so if you want to encourage the person preaching, practice good posture, good seating, good eye contact. Watch them. Watch them. And they'll look up and go, everyone's looking at me. <laughs> now, young preachers don't know how to deal with that sometimes, but that's okay, all right? So listen with your eyes, your ears, and your hands. That's what? Take notes and... Open your Bibles. All right. I'm going to violate one of the things that you have to do if it comes to the message. Because here are some requirements for a message to be effective. And you could add to this list, but I have seven things for the sake of, well, seven's a good number. First of all, it's got to be biblical, doesn't it? Preach the word, Paul tells Timothy. Preach the word, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. That's all we need is the word. It's not about politics. It's not about social events. It's not about quippy stories. And it's preach the word. And across the landscape, there's fewer and fewer congregations, especially among the denomination world, that preach the word, actually. Biblical teaching and has to be an imparting of Scripture. Some way, somehow. Second of all, it's got to be practical and relative. Because what if I said, let's talk about uh, realized eschatology and how it affects um, end time um, happenings. Now, would you be interested? Some of you might be go like, man, I've wanted someone to talk about that. The other you going, who cares? All right? Be practical and relative to your life. You go, man, I, that's something I can do. That's something I can work on in my life. That helps me. That motivates me. Or that, that really pricks my heart. i got to make some changes. I don't care if it's negative or positive. As long as you need to do something and take action in your life or helps you and creates a greater faith or conviction or hope, it's got to be practical and relative. Now, a teacher, I was talking with this Jeff. Uh, Brad's not here, but... What does he teach every year when he has a new group of students? The same thing. Isn't that true? He could care less if it's fresh or new, but you can't do that with your preaching. It's got to be deep for the older Christians that have heard it five times, but and an extensive and thorough, but it's got to be short and simple for the new Christian. So I got to be teaching. 400 level classes as well as 100 level classes in the same lesson 
Because that's how very inextensive the group is. Or else some are going to be sleeping, or some are going to be so overwhelmed, like, what is he talking about? And then also then, it's got to be fresh. I can't recycle every year what I taught last year, or we would have no one left. So when I do teach Acts again, it has to be fresh from a different perspective that's invigorating so you feel like you've never studied it before. And every lesson has to be that way. And you have four lessons a week. If it's two sermons and two adult classes, everyone has to have that type of approach. Who likes leftovers as a regular diet? No one does. Leftovers are okay every now and then, but do you want them every night? Say, so, well, I already preached this. It's a little leftover. Who likes repetition? You hamburgers every night. No, you can't have the same thing over and over and over. So it has to be fresh and stimulating. And then, of course, it has to be balanced. Some knowledge, some practical, uh, speaking about marriage, speaking about some of the requests I get, I got one today, and I'll uh, work on it. Meditation. David meditated in God's word. Is that a subject that'd be practical for your life? I've had people ask about fasting. I've had people ask me about well, a senior, being a senior, how to deal with death. What happens when you die? How can you forgive someone who hasn't asked for forgiveness? You can't believe all the different things you have uh, get requested for, and that's great. I love requests because I, then I know what your needs are and I can speak to them because if there's one person, there's probably others. The half of the ability in uh, preaching is 50% is knowing how to find something or what you know, and then the other 50% is how to find what you don't know to help be able to do good research and study. So a lot of times when you ask for something to meditating, I have a general idea of what it is in Scripture, but I have to do a lot of fresh work and look at it for myself to present something that's palatable, then you can say, yeah, that's good. I can use that in my life. So that's a lot of hours of work, and I'm glad to do it because I'll be, become a better meditator myself upon God's word. So I can get to grow the most. But see, it has to be balanced. You don't want to hear uh, raising up children every Sunday because a lot of you what? don't have children anymore. But it has to be balanced. We haven't had a... Uh, parenting class for a long, long, long time. And so it has to be interesting and motivating. If it's not interesting, if it's not motivating, the sermon doesn't engage. And here's the big thing, it's got to be short. So I got to do all those things, biblical, practical, relative, deep and extensive, but short and simple, fresh, balanced, interesting, motivating. And it's got to be within the time frame or else you're all just, <sighs> all right, time's up, 5.30. Just sing our song and go out of here. I already went over time. I already bro broke that rule. Now, let's be honest. Should we be respectful of the audience as a preacher? You got here and you're out of your love for God and your love for each other. You came out on a Sunday night. God bless you. And if we said we'd be done at 5.30, I should be done at 5.30. 6.30, thank you. 6.30. We start at 5.30. And if we go have 150 people on Sunday morning, let's use that example, and then we go 10 minutes over, say, so what's 10 minutes? Well, it's 10 minutes times 150 people is 1,500 minutes divided by 60. That's 25 collective hours of time you've wasted from people. You've stolen from them. 25 hours just by going 10 minutes. And usually it's rambling. Usually it's stuff that's not pertinent. I'm guilty of it. I struggle because I have so much to say. It's hard to cut it short. In the same breath, you have to be patient with the preacher. Because sometimes we will go long. You are patient. You're very patient and gracious. And I have to work on it. The elders have a conversation every now and with me. So you've got to keep it short. Okay, I'll work on it. But I, so I respect that. I respect that. But see the challenge in having great worship with great preaching? Now we're all done here. Remember the goal, though. The goal is not to have a great sermon just for the sake of having a great sermon. And it's not just to have great preaching so you can say, we got a great preacher. The goal of this part of our worship is so we can become more like Jesus Christ. We can be loving of others like he loved us. 
That's the b biggest challenge in all our lives. Sometimes love has to be strong. Sometimes it's compassionate. But it has to be like Christ. And that's why Paul said this. A preacher has to be passionate. He says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And that's the biggest thing. It has to be passion. Passion from you to hear it. And passion from the speaker to present it. When you put those things together, you'll always have great worship. If you're with us, we have a song that's prepared. Won't you come as we stand and sing just the first verse, please? All right. Would you live for Jesus?